Welcome to the Kingdom Animalia characteristics notes. We're going to talk about the eight characteristics that make animals animals, how they're different from all other forms of life. First characteristics that all animals share is that they are heterotrophs, which means they have to ingest other living organisms in order to derive their energy. This can be done in several different ways. Animals can be filter feeders like the sponge. They can eat plant material other animals or they can be detritivores which means they feed on detritus that's dead or decaying animal and plant material and uh, there's a video on my youtube channel it's just about four minutes it'll give you a little more information on that if you're not familiar with detritivores so check that out our second characteristic of animals hopefully you'll notice a common theme We've got flying swimming running um, all animals are capable of movement Many are able to perform complex, rapid movements, such as the gazelle trying to escape the cheetah in the bottom picture. Um, in the note taking, the plus indicates advantage. So the advantage of movement is that animals are able to go out and search for food, mates, new habitats. They can escape predators. Just significant advantages to being able to move about rather than being anchored to one place like a plant. Third characteristic, all animals are multicellular and um, the bigger the animal, the more cells that it actually has. And so the largest animal is the blue whale, the smallest is the Daphnia. All animals are what we call diploidy or diploid. Die, the prefix means two, so every animal has two copies of each of its chromosomes. That number varies, but they get one copy from each parent. And what this does is the, again, the advantage is that it increases genetic variation. Genetic variation is just the shuffling of genes, uh, bringing together advantageous characteristics that are going to help an animal survive better in its environment. Um, animals aren't clones through when they have genetic variation. And it's just going to ensure that traits are passed down from generation to generation in order for these animals to survive. Our fifth characteristic of animals is that they, uh, they employ sexual reproduction, which by definition is the joining of the egg or sperm cells or what we call gametes. And again, this also contributes to genetic variation. You can see from the photo that the egg cell is significantly larger than the sperm cell. Our sixth characteristic is that animal cells do not have a cell wall. Uh, plant cells don't have any sort of internal support system like a skeleton, so they have to have a cell wall around every single cell to help them stand upright but the animal does not. And what that does is it increases the mobility of the organism as well as the cells themselves. They're mobile, they're not rigid or fixed to one place like a plant is. And even within the animal's body, cells are pliable. Those red blood cells can squeeze through the smallest of the capillaries one at a time. And that's just, uh, you know, again, contributes to mobility, which we've already talked about what the advantages of mobility is. Are. The seventh characteristic that all animals except sponges share is blastula formation. So what happens is when an egg fertilizes, is fertilized by a sperm, it forms a zygote. That's, that's a single cell. That cell divides to become two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, so on and so forth. At about 16 cells, uh, it begins to form a hollow ball that we call a blastula. This is way early on within like the first, you know, 24, 48 hours after fertilization. Within that blastula, the cells begin to differentiate and we call those the primary tissue layers. And there's the ectoderm, the endoderm, and the mesoderm. And we're going to talk more later about those layers specifically. But these primary tissue layers or germ layers are basically your ancestral cells that you had early on in your embryonic development while you were forming in your mother's womb. Your current skin, 
muscle, organ cells, etc., are the offspring of those cells from way back in the day, the first nine months of your formation. Again, we're going to talk more about those in more detail a little bit later. All right, our eighth and final characteristic is that all animals, except sponges, the cells are organized into tissues. So animals are, cells are organized and complex. And so lots of cells form tissues, tissues form organs, organs form organ systems. Therefore, all animals except sponges at least have tissues. And that's just a group of cells that are working together for a specific function, like transmitting a message or movement. And then finally, we're just going to finish up with animal body plans. Um, animals have body parts or appendages arranged basically in three major ways in which we call symmetry. Uh, the first one's pretty easy. It's asymmetrical. Anytime you stick A in front of a word, that word suddenly means not or without. So there's no symmetry um, because the body is oddly shaped or the shape may change. And the most common example of asymmetrical animals are sponges. All right, again, next we have, and we've talked about these two, radial symmetry. Um, these describe bodies that are round or tube-shaped with parts radiating out from a central point, um, such as the hydra, the sea urchin, or the sea anemone. Um, I always say it's like a pizza. If you can cut the animal every which way and get the same half or slice every time it is radial symmetry. Lastly, good old bilateral symmetry. By the prefix means two, so we can only divide that animal um, down one plane into two equal parts. And those two equal parts form a distinct right and left side that are a mirror image of one another. And here's just another couple of examples. Of course, the crayfish is bilateral. Its plane is going right down the middle, and you can see its right and left side distinctly. That other thing, caution not to scale, that's a hydra. It's not nearly that big, but we're just trying to show that it has radial symmetry, and those things are tentacles radiating out from that central tube. Just amid some additional examples arthropods, the human, have bilateral symmetry. Notice the sponge shows up twice because that's what we have for asymmetry in the animal kingdom. Come on, you know, that's just cute. All right. Um, if an organism is bilaterally symmetrical, it will have these four body regions, the anterior, the posterior, the dorsal, and the ventral. Uh, I would strongly suggest maybe doodling a little sketch of an animal and labeling these regions in your notes. You will be responsible for knowing these terms. Dorsal is easy. We've all heard of dorsal because of the dorsal fin, but ventral and anterior and posterior may be new to you. Just to show you how easy it is to do a little sketch and label, I have this for you. So those are the characteristics of the animal kingdom. Let me know if you have any questions when I see you next. Have an awesome evening.